All right. Thank you all for coming. Very lively and engaged group. That's a very good thing. I think we're all interested in what our candidate for the executive director of the Water for Food Institute has to visit with us about today. Dr. Rick Ward is here from the University of Arizona. He has spent some years of his life breeding wheat and uh, now is managing the Maricopa Center at the uh, University of Arizona. So Rick, the floor is yours. Any questions? <laughs> Not that easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Is this okay? The sound is all right. All right. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the committee, the selection committee, for giving me this opportunity. This is an exciting, this has been an exciting day, it's been an exciting uh, process. The subtitle of my talk is Phase 2, Building on Success. And I had chosen that subtitle before I came based on my research and analysis of what has taken place in the past five years. And I genuinely believe that that title is relevant and correct, okay. So the Institute was founded on the, on the basis of the crying need for more food production to reach food security without putting stress on water supplies. And I'm just grounding the, the, the talk in this image which I borrowed from the World Resources Institute which shows the increase in many agricultural areas by 2025 in water stress due to growing water use and higher temperatures due of course to population growth, urbanization, economic growth and climate change and I guess uh, this is one of two world maps that I'll I'll put up, um, this is my world, it's your world too, but I have a visceral sense of it. I've flown around it several times. Uh, and you do, over time, build a, a map in your head of the places you've been. And so I know that that red area right there in South Asia, Central Asia, encompasses a very significant portion of the people on the planet. And to see it red in 10 years having the highest increase in water stress condition, um, along with major populated areas of Africa and East Asia, China, is very frightening and very uh, much evidence of need to engage, hence my interest in this institute. So my goals today are to communicate with you about my background. I want to do that in the context of those things that I've done that I think of have meaning to my potential role, my candidacy for this position. Uh, I'm going to repeat a few times that one of the big uh, features of my career I want to emphasize is that I have had the great fortune to be successful at getting smart people for multiple disciplines to work together to generate solutions. My career from 1981 to 2015, I break into three segments uh, that I'm going to present to you as two segments. 
And I'm going to start in the middle because um, this is the domestic part of my career. I spent 16 years as a wheat breeder geneticist at Michigan State University. I also was an agronomist there. We increased the productivity of wheat so the state yields went up 25 percent. And this is my definition of impact is that people have adopted a technology and it's having a favorable impact on their lives and the economy. Whoops. But the thing I want to focus on from that 16 years was this initiative called the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. It was started in 1997. It was a consortium of smart people rallied around the need to solve a major disease problem that was threatening barley and wheat growers in, in the industry with reduced economic returns. It's also a food safety issue. So I was one of the founders of this idea. There was not a call for proposals. Um, basically, stakeholders from 15 states went to Congress and said, this is something we need work done on. And the result was $5 million a year starting in about 99. And it's still happening today. So this uh, initiative was stakeholder driven. As I said, the money went through ARS, USDA ARS, but my office managed an annual call for proposals, stakeholder committees, uh, steering committee, six research committees ranging from transgenesis solutions to uh, biological control and breeding in between. The total awards s since 1999 at more than 15 land grants in USDA uh, is $80 million. Now I, I can't, I don't claim credit for all of that, but I will say that my vision of how this could serve the United States and be of use to multiple communities uh, continues to be manifest in this. And by the way, University of Nebraska, during my tenure, received $853,000 and totally has received $1.7 million. Um, so, I can say I know how to bring money to Nebraska <laughs> already. All right, my time at Michigan State was flanked by 17 total years in international agriculture. I was a maize breeder, corn breeder for Cement, based in Mexico and then based in Zimbabwe. If you've been to Zimbabwe and you've been to Cement's research station just north of Harare, you've been to one of my successes because I built that station from scratch. Uh, I created its mission. Uh, I was sent over uh, with, this was the golden days. No budget, just go have impact. And to this day, this is the site that uh, the CGIR uses to coordinate maize research in Southern Africa, and maize is a major source of calories. I also worked for Pioneer Overseas Corporation for two years, focused on, uh, I was in the U.S. by about two miles, and my target area and most of my work was Mexico and Central America, and interestingly, Egypt. But the part I really want to talk about is the last 10 years when I returned to CIMIT, I, I, CIMIT is the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. It was founded and wrapped around the work, well, it was wrapped around the work of Norman Borlaug and colleagues. And Norman Borlaug was the Nobel Peace Laureate in 1970 for his efforts in the Green Revolution, uh, which were done at the location that became CIMIT. Uh, so in these 10 years, I worked as, I'm my own definition, national and international consortia designer and leader. Uh, and 
I worked for the Simic Global Wheat Program, and I also worked for Cornell University in the midst of that. I was in Mexico, and then Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The Afghanistan-Pakistan was two and a half years, and I finished out my time with Simic in Minnesota. Not to work for Minnesota, but they got an airport you can get anywhere in the world. Uh, and I have family reasons to be in, in Minnesota. Okay, so I want to emphasize two programs that I worked on that I think are relevant to my experience or my, uh, anyway, the future of the Institute. If I was lucky enough to be its director. One is the Boyle Global Rust Initiative. So this is the same guy I just mentioned. Uh, that's Norman Borlaug. He was 92 or 3 when that picture was taken. I traveled with him to Ethiopia, Kenya, Canada, Washington, D.C. Uh, when he was 92. Um, he wouldn't let me carry his suitcase. He wouldn't let anybody carry his suitcase. Uh, and he's my, he's my role model. So my plan is to work till I'm 92. <laughs> Uh, I'm taking it day by day <laughs> and year by year, but uh, one reason I left Simmet is he retired at 65 from Simmet. Nobody else can retire after 65. If Norm Borlaug could do it, the rest of us have to do it. And I'm too close to that number. And so I got on the market in order to position myself for the next, uh, I've got I have 31 years left, so that's that's that's. If you're wondering why did I leave Simit, and I left Simit, that was the fourth time. I'm the only person in the world, I believe, who signs four contracts with Simit. Uh, one of us might be crazy. I'm not sure. Uh, this Borlaug Global Rust Initiative thing I wanted to emphasize in this slide uh, is one that. We work together, but other people on this list that you can't you can't actually see. So I'm going to point it out. This is the director of uh, International Ag Research in Canada. This is the director of CSIRO in Australia. Chinese uh, vice president of CAS for international collaboration. Uh, Mangala Rai, the DG of uh, India's. Apex body, same for Pakistan, Turkey, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Icarda is Director General, the top FAO person uh, for agriculture, Shivaji Pandey, uh, Kay Simmons, USDA. Those were the people I was rolling with. <laughs> and I would organize their meetings and uh, that's something that I bring as a network as well as you know, anybody who gets to work with Dr. Borlaug gets to see everybody puts their pants on the same way. And uh, so working with people of stature, at the apex of national programs, um, I do so with humility, but I know I can do so with confidence. So a related project, and actually the source of funds for this, uh, Morlock Global Rust Initiative, was the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat project. Um, so the first two years uh, after I left Michigan State, I worked to, my, I went to Simmet to work with Dr. Borlaug and others to mobilize awareness and resources for the battle against the stem rust called UG99. And that's what the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative was about. And I worked with Kathy Kahn, a brand new program officer, who's no longer a brand new program officer, but at the Gates Foundation. And, and together with Cornell staff and people all over the world, we design a program that includes there's one or two extra ones here that weren't there when I was there. But, but basically, uh, almost all of these 
dots on this map were partners in this durable rust resistance and wheat DRRW project. We had 15 major partners in 13 countries. So we, we had work in China, Australia, Israel, Syria. That was an interesting, I had, I had to have two passports in order to do that, uh, to go from Syria to Israel and you don't do it in one flight. Um, Turkey, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, Mexico, Denmark, multiple places in the United States. And this was a $9 million a year program that is in its last year now. The first year was 2008. You can do the math, uh, how many dollars that was. Uh, this, this, also, this not only was global, truly global, but it also was broad in discipline. We had people working on molecular biology. We had people working on immunity of rice, the, the molecular biology of immunity of rice to rust. I, interestingly, because that was an idea Dr. Borlaug had. How do you make wheat not a host of stem rust? And since rice was a non-host, it's a grass, we were investing in Australia and China and Erie, the Philippines, uh, to investigate that. So that was one end. Another was just straight up breeding, seed production, fungicide. Uh, we had a whole component called advocacy. And that advocacy component, which I led, resulted in the FAO endorsing it accepting the notion that UG99 was a global threat to the, a transboundary pest of global proportions. That meant every government, that means every government in the world today knows what UG99 is. And that, so we branded our work UG99, which was the name of this pest. After Cornell, and I left, <laughs> I left Cornell because, okay, the project was working and it was going forward. Uh, I was about two degrees separated from wheat fields or other uh, agricultural settings. So uh, I wanted to get back in the action and I did. I ended up in Afghanistan and I'm just showing you this slide because that's me in the center there in the flak jacket. Um, this is in Helmand province. I'm told after the visit that actually that was the wrong team. That was the other guys. Uh, they didn't shoot us so it was okay, but they grow wheat too. So in other words, these, these were uh, Taliban. We drove into Taliban country and we didn't mean to. But my point here is that I'm not talking about doing ag, international ag from the United States and doing visits. I'm talking about being embedded, being right there. So I was the country officer. I represented Senate for both F, the, to the governments of Afghanistan and Pakistan. In Pakistan, we developed a $30 million program that was nation, national in scope. Uh, called the Agricultural Innovation Program. And this is interesting because the money came from the mission, the Islam Islamabad U.S. Embassy mission. It doesn't come from D.C. So there's money to be had in the embassies of the United States and other embassies, and it's a place to look for international work. The other thing I want to emphasize here is the logos on the bottom are from the Pakistan Agriculture Research Council, the Global, the World Festival Center, the Rice Research Institute, the Livestock Research Institute, UC Davis, which all, so this was a trans, uh, another tra international tr uh, trans, uh, institutional trans 
uh, disciplinary program that was very complicated. Had complete. Had, we had buy-in from all four provincial governments and the federal government in Pakistan, and that took about a year and a half to get. Um, okay, so there's all three of those periods. Uh, of, and that's the background and the thing I want to emphasize uh, is that I had experience in and success in both international and domestic realms raising money for multidisciplinary groups of, of scientists and putting it into forms that fund holders would continue to fund. So, uh, in total, in that in the period I'm talking about, in the international period, I, I believe that I was instrumental in $102 million being mobilized. Today, I'm the director of the Maricopa Ag Center and the Bud Antle Endowed Chair. That red uh, perimeter uh, surrounds that center. We call it MAC. 2,100 acres, 1,700 arable. Those 1,700 are all irrigated. They're supplied water by 25 miles of concrete ditch. Uh, the water comes from the Colorado River. It comes from groundwater. It comes from reclaimed water. We are about to get reclaimed water. So we're commingling multiple sources of water now. And this slide, I just I'm I'm going to focus only on the third bullet that. The purpose I have at MAC is to develop solutions to growth in agricultural outputs and economy in general within drier and hotter environments. So this is this is my water. This is where I'm immersed in water, and I catch myself every time I say that. Uh, but we are at the uh, interface with Phoenix. So the, the policy and politics of urban, ag, ag, rural, water is right on our radar all the time. Water quality, salinity is on our mind. That, uh, that is a constant issue with irrigation. All right. So I'm going to go on to what excites me about WFI. Well, first, and this is a bit of an awakening, awakening for me, because I'm an agriculturalist, as you can tell by what I've just told you. And I'm saying that in the context of one of the goals of the Institute is to close the gap between the agricultural community and the water community. And of course, that's an oxymoron to say agriculture it implies doesn't need water. Um, and now today, I'm a proponent of saying, well, actually, uh, crops and animals are just ways to convert water into food as opposed to treating the water as if it's a non-essential input. In fact, what I've gathered is that we in the agricultural community have treated water like it's air. It's always there, it's available. Uh, and so Closing that gap is valuable, but also I'm interested in impact. I've had impact in Southern Africa. Uh, I've had impact in the United States. I've had impact in Pakistan. I've had outcomes that should lead to impact uh, uh, there. And I want to continue to do that. So I was asked, why would I want to come here? Because I see an opportunity to have more impact than I could have anywhere else. That's, that's what I see. So water as a, common, a truly common denominator means it's an inroad to any discussion about food security, water security, health, general human dignity, and avoiding catastrophe as we add another two billion people to the planet and it's heating up. Other features, the Institute has built an exceptionally strong foundation. The university provided an exceptionally found, strong foundation, and I now realize the university structured 
for an extraordinarily strong foundation. I'm telling people, I was at Kansas State in 1980, about 1980, when the experiment station director sued the vice president for agriculture and then started a defense fund for him. So there was this incredibly public blow up of the management of the agriculture unit in Kansas. Every land grant is vulnerable to that kind of meltdown. This one seems to have fixed that problem 40 years ago. And the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the way it's configured and the way the stakeholders support it, I think uh, assures that there will be stability in governance. And that is really, really important. It's important to people giving money too. They want to know that the institute is going to stay in the same place on the organization chart, more or less. I see a great alignment of my own background with this challenge of working towards water and a food secure world. I like the strong ties to the private sector, both from the founding and from work that's going on, the Circles Project. I know from, I know from hard experience, change happens, innovation as you say defines it, which would be transform transformational technology or knowledge that's adopted by millions. So an iPad, that concept, iPod, that was transformational. Hybrid maze is transformational. Semidorf wheat was transformational. Incremental change, sorry, is innovation. Incremental change is not innovation, not in their vocabulary. I know that the only way transformation happens is the private sector. And by the way, the farmers are the private sector. They're not the public sector. So, but I really mean the input suppliers and providers. Uh, and, and so I'm glad to see, because we're still leaving an era where the public sector, in many cases, puts itself at arm's length from the private sector. And that's absurd, in my view. I like the opportunity to bridge agriculture and water communities and health. And I'll talk about that again later. So the current, and I think sound vision, is for a food and water secure world. One in which agriculture water does not threaten or put stress on water required for ecosystem services and, and other important factors in human life and health. And the subject areas, you know well, yield and water gap, productivity, yield, productivity gaps, groundwater management, high productivity irrigation, and then freshwater ecosystem services and human health. So I want to review successes that I see. Uh, as I said, we're, my title is Building on Success. The Circles Project I already mentioned in Tanzania where whole villages will, you're attempting to work under, one, under uh, center pivots. Um, the Atlas, the Yield and Water Atlas, I think is, is an extraordinary partnership with, with extraordinary reach and a great platform to build upon. The fact that Waganagan and Altera are engaged is very positive. The uh, recent Nebraska Natural Resources District report is a great output that's useful to the, to the world. The partnerships with China are good footholds into a very, very big part of the world. In education, the Master of Science dual program that, sh that was developed by the Institute and UNESCO that is at Delft in the Netherlands and here, the Water Advanced Research Innovation Fellowship Program, and the progress towards enrichment of undergrad University of Nebraska curricula. Those are all good things. I put in red the Water for Food conferences, and I said to some of you today that uh, I, have, I can't help but, when I think about the Water for Food conferences, I think, boy, this could be the Davos World Economic uh, Summit 
for water, for food. Uh, you're on track to doing that. And I also think the digital presence, which includes, so I've watched many of the talks of many of those uh, conferences by going to YouTube, by going to your website and going to YouTube. And that's been a fantastic learning experience for me, and it will be and is for anybody else who can watch it. So I think you, that the Institute's done very well in its digital presence, and clearly uh, the global and national linkages established by uh, Roberto Lenton, Nick, etc., have uh, they're very self-evident. The brand is out there, and this is very important. So I've summarized how my background basically in raising money and bringing people together uh, not only to come up with good ideas but then find ways to package it so somebody will give money to it and keep giving money to it. Uh, I've told you what excites me about the Institute and now I'm going to tell you my vision for the Institute and how I would lead it. So in phase two this is, this is just a shot I would say it's a, just elements of a vision for success in bullet format. The, the Institute is a global, I'm going to describe this in five years, say the Institute is a global thought leader in water for, in the water for food nexus. Um, you're on your way now. You have sustainable funding. That's a huge challenge. That's the kind of challenge I relish. You have whole of university engagement. You're on your way to that. It's a hard, long job. I've been tenured faculty, and the biggest thing to know about tenured faculty is they do what they want to do. So the trick is to put something they want to do in front of them, which means talking to them, listening, finding common ground that they have excuse me, they haven't seen yet, uh, and that takes, that takes time, but I think, uh, well, I know it can be done. And I hope I said that one of the things that excites me about Nebraska is the faculty and students of Nebraska, the university, the entire system. I said the leadership was great, but I should have said the faculty is a phenomenal asset. And I wouldn't say that about any university. I think Nebraska is at, the university is at a very strong point in its history. Um, I don't want to say it hasn't been stronger before, but it's, it's, to me, it seems very impressive. I'm watching what kind of hiring is going on. Uh, in the faculty and it's looking very, very uh, forward. It's forward leaning, let's put it that way. So other parts of the vision for success, the Institute have a portfolio of transformative projects and programs that advance the food for water agenda and impacts people. And I'll come back to transformative projects and programs in a moment, what I mean by that. And it's also bridging the spectrum of policy, research, education, and advocacy. Before I come back to what do I mean by transformative programs and projects, I want to talk about, now I'm going to tell you where I see there are opportunities. Um, and, and so this is part of the vision thing. Just because you see it doesn't mean it's really there, but sometimes it is, and I can say, I can tell you that every one of the major initiatives that I helped start, almost everybody told me were crazy ideas. So then again, there's about nine out of 10 they tell me are crazy and really are crazy. So well, that's a disclaimer. But I think that the Institute should partner heavily with USAID. You've got a good start on that. USAID has a Global Development Laboratory. I, can I ask, how many of you know about the Global Development Laboratory? 
two, three. It's an incredibly well-kept secret of our government. <laughs> uh, it is, is it fair to say it, that does still reflect the, the main uh, paradigm through which USAID is bringing science to development? Tom, would you say that? Or, I mean, that's, that's the intention. Sometimes these things start and then they fizzle out and go away. But it's an umbrella set of focal points. And under that, there are uh, a couple of vehicles, a couple of ways in which they're investing in US universities. But before I get to that, I want to say that the university can be a leading higher ed partner for water for food issues for USAID projects. Who do they call when they have water in a project? Texas A&M has an innovation lab for small scale irrigation. That's not water for food. So who else do they call? I don't know who they call. I mentioned Texas, it's, feed, it's a Feed the Future Innovation Lab. So I think that the, initiative, the Institute could create the equivalent of a Feed the Future Water for Food Innovation Lab. You're almost there now. See, the question, what I think is that should be something USAID is funding here. How do you do it? Well, you can try brute strength, and sometimes this works. If your entire congressional delegation descends on the right committee, or the administrator, or the acting administrator, you might get a, okay, it's done, you're there. And a million dollars a year is flowing, and it'll keep flowing. Um, trouble is, you ask that question that way, and they say no. You're, <laughs> you're, you just closed and open and close the door in a hurry. So my thought is that you, you create that functionality. You make, you make yourself available in that way. You make the optics, make it clear that's exactly what you're doing. And then it becomes an inescapable conclusion with a little nudge from appropriate corners that it gets endorsed and brought into the innovation lab uh, cluster. And Virginia, uh, Washington, Kansas has three. All the, there, many states have innovation labs, and they all have continued funding, and they are a replacement for what used to be called crisps. Crisp. Like Insor Mill was a crisp. It used to be here. It's not here anymore. Nebraska doesn't have one right now. I think you deserve it. I think it would be to the interest of the United States for one to be here. Um, the other element, the other feature that, the other vehicle that I see USAID investing in is what's called the Higher Education Solutions Network. MIT has two <coughs> higher education solution centers. Berkeley has one. Tulane has one. Maryland has one. And they're on issues that are related to development. So what are they? They are literally the Rolodex of who does USAID or anybody else in the US government call if, they, if a mission says, wow, we see an opportunity or a need to build a dam or there's a river dying and something needs to be done about it. The idea is the US government has somebody to call. I just mentioned two water things. If it's, if it's uh, computer sciences, they call MIT. Um, if it's design, they call Berkeley. They don't have anybody to call for water. So there are these two networks. One is higher education solutions, they might be labs, let's call them centers, and then innovation labs that are technology development groups. My guess is that after these two or three years they've existed, that 
people see a better way to do both of them. And the idea would be take the best of both and make that a Nebraska agency, entity, and do it through the auspices of the Water for Food Institute. By doing so, you are availing the rest of the world in our government with best advice, immediate access to expertise, not just Nebraska, but anywhere Nebraska can reach, in Water for Food. So you want to get this on the national, if, you, if we truly believe in this topic, it needs to be on the agenda of the United States of America. That, that's my sense. So that's one idea. That's sort of a big idea. The other thing is, um, let's see, uh, $35 million of money I mobilized in Pakistan all came from the mission. I mentioned this. Every mission embassy, every embassy that has a USAID mission, Ethiopia, Kenya, Zimbabwe, has its own budget. In fact, I'm pretty sure the majority of the money for development, for ag work, goes through the missions, not through Washington, D.C. They ask Washington, D.C. for advice and endorsement. So it's, you don't ignore Washington, D.C. But what I've learned to do is go look at the embassy's website and ask what are they mandated to do? What did they say they're going to work on? Then find what you can do to support that and then pick up the phone, call them and say, hey, we can deliver on this. There's a new foundation for food and agriculture research, $200 million. Appropriated by Congress, USDA manages it somehow, but it's not USDA. I think it seeks one-for-one one matches, or eventually it will, with industry relate well, non-federal funding. So I could imagine an irrigation technology, and this is for the United States, not for develop, not for overseas. So I could imagine a, a, an industry, uh, the irrigation industry, partnering with the institute on behalf of the faculty for Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. The National Academy of Science has a program called Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement and Research. It, PEER, it's funded by USAID. As far as I can see, there's one of these grants at Nebraska. When I went to the five years of grants they've issued, and they're substantial, not millions, but they're still substantial. Um, I searched for the word water and I found it 60 times on the page. Now, that might just mean just 30 projects um, because somebody's affiliation might have had water and the title had water. But there are at least 30 projects out of 80 or 120 were related to water. So can the institute help the faculty access those grants? I'm not, there's only so many ways to split the, the content expertise like Nick <laughs> to be PIs. I think the institute's role is to mobilize and facilitate the faculty as a whole. And that's where you get their eyes opening that, hey, you're adding value to what I want. Expanded private foundation engagement, uh, traditional projects, with log frames, timelines, budgets. The Gates Foundation is that way, but also pull type projects like the Skoll Foundation or the Ag Results Initiative, which is a G20 uh, pot of money that identifies entrepreneurs who are having impact, whose products are reaching tens of thousands of people already, and an award or an investment will multiply it. Um, is there something the Institute could provide in value to such foundations that want to support individual entrepreneurs, monitoring evaluation, uh, 
back office support for that entrepreneur, uh, lateral movement of the concept. I think it's possible. And expanded NGOs with NGOs that are successfully scaling out to over 10,000 farms. I'm just saying, uh, no, you're not a development agency, you never will be. But there are development agencies out there that could benefit from a direct tie to a land-grant university in the United States focused on water for food. Other opportunities, uh, I think catalyzing enrichment of K-12 and higher ed on-the-job learning opportunities for Nebraska and the rest of the world is valuable. Strength and socioeconomic and related subject expertise. Uh, after today, I'd say maybe that one wasn't relevant. Partner with key international professional societies for expanded global networking. This came across when I was applying for a grant. Um, they wanted to create a network for in ag engineers developing uh, appropriate scale technology. So, you know, you think, well, you can start a website, you can start membership, you can do all kinds of things. And then it dawned on me, well, there's this thing called the uh, American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers that has an international section that does exactly that. So why not partner with such institutes, such societies who already are spending money embracing the idea of bringing more people into the tent. And I'm talking about for international. Um, the same for the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, the American Society of Agronomy, the American Society of Civil Engineers. I believe all of those have international sectors, uh, sections that seek to broaden the impact to the developing world. CGIR programs are opportunities, not enough of them have water in it. IMI, you already have a relationship with. Uh, the others, it would be valuable. Creating an outfacing web presence that enables potential collaborators, funders, beneficiaries to easily understand who you are and what you provide. What's your organization? What are your product services and experiences that you offer? What types of outputs can be delivered? And fostering open data practices that facilitate interoperability, that applies to about any, any arena today. Um, you had an entire conference on big data and its application to this. Maximize use of social media for advocacy. I think I'm preaching to the converted on that one. So how do you get sustainable funding for the Institute? Right now the sources are the university. That's going to go down. That's what I, I'm going to, I think that's going to go down. Gifts, federal and private grants, endowments, all are possible. I've mentioned a few that I think are worth pursuing, but all require clear value propositions and an overarching business model that can be understood, presented potentially in different ways depending on who's looking at it. Um, I also think that leveraging the human health, energy, and national security linkages the university has are, are you know, those are where the pockets are infinitely deep. And I have to tell you, I, I'm, I'm having to force myself to say this. If I stood in front of an audience in Arizona and said, I better stop, this is being recorded. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, the executive director's role. So I want to tell you what, what I think, uh, what I imagine the role sh could be, should be, what I might like if I was so blessed. Foster a collaborative environment that embraces diversity to build effective teams. And I, Im I imagine a rolling portfolio of teams addressing a rolling portfolio of programs and uh, projects. So 
a more a flatter structure, which you already have. Um, I like to lead with vision. I get vision by listening to people. Uh, I don't think anybody does. It doesn't just pop out of nowhere. I like to encourage integrators. I think I'm an integrator. That's what I want to be. I think that's vital to bringing disparate groups together. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what that means. And increasing total influence, and I, I need to say that those last two come from the book Six Simple Rules from Boston Consulting Group. Um, so I, I, I like, I'm, I'm only telling you two of them, but increasing total influence means push the power or influence at the top as far down as it'll go, it makes sense. Okay, that means not being authoritative. It means putting the decision-making capacity with the people who are facing the realities influencing that decision. I'd like to manage, see the resources of WFI managed to sustain and grow the University of Nebraska's input as an agent of change in the water for food nexus and catalyze and support transformative partnerships and programs. So the first part is saying what I think maybe the director should be judged on is what's the University of Nebraska's in, impact on the world? It's not how many publications, it's not how many, uh, it's not even how many dollars came in, it's how much impact is at least logically projected to be in the pipeline and do that by catalyzing and supporting transformative partnerships and programs. And what do I mean by that? They're systems oriented, they're innovative, they multiply the impact of the entire university community. They're outcome driven, meaning people receive and take into their possession, at least, and use the results, the technology, the knowledge, focused on pathways to impact, which is the next stage, which means you actually have benefit by adopting, by having, engaging in the outcome. Pathways to impact people locally, so Nebraska is equally focused of, of, of interest, the region, nationally and globally. So I'm, I'm going to go fast because I'm running out of time. Uh, I also like the book Blue Ocean Strategy. And I like their logic. And their, their, their logic is create uncontested market space. A red ocean is where sharks are eating each other. A blue ocean is where there's no competition. A Water for Food Institute endorsed by USAID known to the entire world has no competition. And to keep it that way, you need to keep adapting and adding value to the changing innovation landscape. That's outward looking. And also continually inventing new ways to add value to the work in, and impact of the Nebraska community, inward looking to other customers who are the faculty and students of Nebraska. So in summary, I'm going to read this quote. You can read it too, but Robert B. Doherty envisioned this institute as a place where the best minds come together to find solutions that will improve the quality of life for people around the world through strategic and responsible use of water. Bringing the best minds together. Well, they're already together on this campus, and if you looked at two degrees of separation from everybody on this campus, you'd probably get about everybody who's got a good mind. And what's needed is for the institute to provide value in 
accessing resources and focusing on problems, adding value to the faculty. And the faculty includes several people on the institute staff. But I'm just making clear that I know that the faculty is the expertise, the primary source of the expertise. The institute's core is a facilitating body, also an expertise source. Experts who facilitate, which is what I think I've been um, in the past, are very valuable. So I've tried to emphasize today that I have been successful in mobilizing money in multidisciplinary areas, which means bringing people together, finding common ground, finding the common log frame or uh, results framework that multiple parties can buy into and that a donor or a fund holder embraces. Um, I've also shared with you my enthusiasm for the Institute, and that's only grown today. Uh, no matter what, you're on track. This is a really good thing. I, my, my parents were married within a few miles of here in 1948, and my great, my second great-great-grandfather uh, came to Nebraska in 1862. So I feel like I have some ownership here and some roots, and I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the institution. I'm proud of the, the Nebraska stakeholders and farmers for having created the capacity and opportunity for this. And I'm humbled to uh, even be considered for this kind of a role, and I thank you very much. your turn. Do you have questions for Rick? Francisco. Thanks for, for your talk. I really enjoy it. My question is if I can make it the sound simple. How we transition from research into action and how the dirty water for food institute or what kind of role will the Darty or Putin Institute would be playing in enhancing this transition and enhancing our understanding of this next wire. Okay, so how to transition research into products, into action, impacts, and what's the role of the Institute in doing that? My own experience is it's, uh, it's how, to, how research is designed and what its goals are uh, is, ra is rather important. If you don't have outcomes at least plausibly identified, uh, somebody adopting something, then if you generate new knowledge, surely one day there will be an outcome. Will it be in your lifetime? You don't know. So. I think the Institute can help. There is a whole way of addressing research that the international community has embraced where dollars are associated with activities that generate outputs and generate outcomes leading to impacts. If you can't show that or some other vocabulary, if you don't have that in your proposal, then you're not likely to get there sharing different ways that's done. And if you want money from USAID, you better be able to do that. <laughs> uh, because that's, that's what they want to see. In fact, they've got a book of impact metrics like this. So I think the Institute can be a facilitator. Uh, there's a project writer, project development person, who I'm sure has these skills. Uh, and also, just simply, what I find when I go around, I'm in Pakistan, I ask a young researcher, what, what, are, what are you doing? And so I'm doing biotechnology. 
uh, to what what's the purpose of your research? I want to get a plasmid into this state. Um, Got to ask about eight questions before you get to and why. And that's a paradigm shift. I don't know where Nebraska's at. Frankly, I don't know where Americans are at. I'm still figuring that out. Uh, but I know 10 years ago, I didn't talk that way. I didn't think that way. If you ask me, what, what's my job? I said, I was, you know, what's the purpose of my, my work? It was to breed new varieties. Now I say, the purpose of my work is farmers get more yield per acre or other input so that they can use those resources elsewhere through new varieties. The Institute can help promote that paradigm. So again, I don't want to judge, I don't know where the paradigm is right now. That, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I congratulate you for a very impressive uh, presentation and uh, very many successes that you have had. Uh, my question is, as you know, uh, the world agriculture is rampant, uh, so it will have a big impact on food production and food security. Uh, in the video, very first uh, slide, you have showed the wildfire stress in many parts of the world, and so that would definitely impact the food security in the future. And so the hydroclimatic uh, climate change and also hydroclimatic extremes would, uh, such as droughts and floods would affect the food production and food security. So in your view, you have touched it a little bit, but uh, in your view, what should the Water for Food Institute do in order to address the hydroclimatic extremes like droughts and floods now and in the future here in Nebraska or around the world? Well, adaptation strategies, I mean, I don't think you're asking any specifics, but water capture and water storage on farm, things like that, conservation agriculture as a uh, soil moisture preserving technique. Uh, what I, I don't think the institute is in a position to set the tone or theme of global research. I think it's positioned to influence that, inform it. Um, but to some extent, their reaction, their, it's, it's a, what, what's needed? What are the demands? Uh, so, well, here's what I want to say is that, that the Institute, it seems to me, should be agile, have enough agility, which means there's enough flexibility and budget to respond to any rational and impactful suggestion. So if the government of a country or a mission in a country uh, believe that Water harvesting is an important investment, uh, even if it's not something anybody's working on right now. I'd, li I'd like to see that the, in the WFI is one of the places that gets called. What would you do? And have the Institute have the agility to see, well, what could be mobilized, ask, I mean, how do you know what everybody's doing on the campus at any one time? That's pretty hard. And then, if it makes sense, provide support to initiate, explore the, the concept, a site visit, uh, and then uh, help operationalize it. It, it, you know, provide I know as an individual researcher, it, you know, the heavy lifting of getting through the documentation that a lot of organizations want to see uh, stops you from going after certain resources. So I, I'm saying that the whole spectrum of water uh, 
as it relates to food and health should be open obviously got to be careful not to get overextended but that that would be you know it's based on the expertise that's available to the institute to reach for yes i like your example of the wheat scab project if you were going to do that for wfi what area that the university and wfi is working in would you choose push a big initiative like that. Okay, so what, yeah, what? Then like what partners, you know? Well, irrigation, sprinkler, lateral, overhead irrigation, um, high pro productivity irrigation, the, the yield gap, um, Yield and water productivity gap already has some significant partnerships. That's the one that has the broadest international reach right now. And, and it is right on a vital issue. So I'm not sure it, the SCAB initiative was a problem in the face of industry uh, right here. Well, I'm trying to get more aside from the international stuff. What if you were to do something in the U.S., which is what the SCAP one was, really, it was more focused on the U.S. It was totally. Yeah. So I'm thinking more of that. What, you know, I, I just, and I know this is kind of a hard question because. Well, I don't think there's a single voice or place for a single voice for agriculture to express itself for instance, I'm not fully familiar with the Des Moines situation, but there's a lawsuit that threatens agricultural production and uh, because of nitrate pollution. So is there sensible advocacy for sensible policies coming out of, I don't know, whether it's Farm Bureau or uh, other national organizations, or could they could they be uh, harnessed to say, you know, we need a voice in this arena that's providing unbiased information and either they fund it. So here's another way. Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, the big, the big companies, they could be approached for training uh, so I think there are critical masses. Um, it's a little. I mean, I'm thinking more in terms of research, which is what the scab thing was. You got all this money come, to come from the government to the universities to do research on an important problem. And I think that's one of the things we need to do with DWFI is find, find a project like that where we can partner nationally and well, use our strengths. okay, but that was a push. So that that was, you know, you do tricks like um, you're, you 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 have the most important constituent in a district call the office in Congress ten minutes before you walk in, and they say the same thing you say, and suddenly it's on the radar of that representative of Congress. Um, but how to partner with neighboring states. NEFA is announcing their uh, challenge grant awards right now. Um, I, I don't know who is receiving those, but if the Institute can help in a, in a hub way, if you stand up and say, hey, we're going to lead this, you'll probably lose all your colleagues in a hurry. But if you, if you say, hey, we like to help make sure this happens, we don't care who gets it. As long as Nebraska people are involved, we've, we're justified in pursuing it. So I, in the Infuse program, NSF, USDA, that's a lot of money coming. And partnerships across water basins, um, across ecologies or aquifers, I think make 
a lot of sense. So I, 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 I'm, that's probably where I should have gone. There's a lot of ways to reach to neighbors who don't have the lifting power or the concentration. And if you do it in a non-threatening way, meaning you're going to co-brand, you're going to, you're not going to subsume everybody else. I, I find most people are willing to partner when they see sense. Yeah, I just think it would be great if we could identify the area, the, the research, the theme or the topic that could bring everybody together. I, I agree. I think that's a, primarily a function, though. So, okay, influence what is being funded by the federal government or conservation agencies or, or you know, uh, other institute other fund holders but within the given year make sure you're aware of and responding in time to every opportunity that exists so I would see the portfolio would probably be at least 50 to 75 percent competitive grants that the Institute doesn't get individual faculty get but the Institute plays a role and can co-brand because it's adding value to it. Okay, Sorry. one more question and then we'll retire to the reception out in the foyer where you'll have an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with Rick. Any other questions? We exhausted it. All right, let's give him a hand.